our hockey insider today and every day is brought to you by Pro-Am Sports. They've got a few signings locked and loaded right now over at proamsports.ca. Ethan Morrow, deadline for that is March 27th. That's next Wednesday. Vincent DeHarnay, private signing. Deadline for that is April 3rd. And Ryan Smith back for another signing. Uh, that'll be happening. Uh, the deadline for that is Saturday, April 6th. So opportunities to get some stuff signed by Ryan Smith, Vincent, and uh, Ethan Morrow. Marshall Ferguson from TSN on the way. One of my fellow CFL play-by-play men. He's at the CFL Combine. Elks hold the first pick. He'll be by Cool Bet Hotline of the Day coming up. And that keyword to Vegas in about 40 minutes. That'll be happening right here on EST as well. Let's bring in Mike Johnson this morning. Uh, MJ, good morning. How you doing, buddy? Good morning, fellas. I am very well. I heard the intro. Yeah. Can someone explain the new sliding rule in baseball? I, I saw <laughs> that yeah. yesterday. Dusty will do it gladly. Honestly, He's been I, a- <laughs> I, don't, I don't get fussed about baseball. I don't even like watch the baseball that much, but it seems maybe because they want to get in the way player safety or something, but it seems so ridiculous that, you know, if your toe is three inches over the bag, you're somehow hindering the guy trying to steal second base. He's automatically safe. It just, I saw the one yesterday and thinking this is not the intention of the rule at all. It seemed ridiculous to me. It can't be the case. Like, and I'm going to full blown rant on this around 7:45 today, (laughs) but like (laughs) you sit there and you're going to tell me that you're going to call that guy safe in game four of a world series. On a play like that, like come on, it's not gonna happen. He had the, the the second baseman had like half of his foot covering the bag. The rest of his body was completely out of the way. Like, what are they trying to do here? I don't. Yeah, man, I don't know baseball. I just oh, it drives me. <laughs> and it was I, there, I, like yeah. Uh, the guy was twelve away from the base. Like it, yes. like, it wasn't barely. It was so far ahead of us with the runner. I'm like, I don't know. I don't know. It's a little, a little much for me. Uh, all right, we've got lots to get to. Obviously, Oilers and Leafs tomorrow. It's going to be a big one. We'll uh, we'll set that up here as we work our way through the segment. Last night, it was a relatively closely played hockey game until the third period where the Oilers really opened it up. And there's been a lot of uh, Matthias Ekholm praise on this show today. And, mm-hmm. you know, we talked a lot about, you know, Zach Hyman being probably the best free agency signing in Oilers history. But as far as the trade for Ekholm last year, it's got to be up there as far as one of the best trades in Oilers history go. He has just come in, stabilized the blue line, and as we said this morning on the show, everything he does, he does hard all the time. Yeah, absolutely. And it's amazing, you know, how perfectly he fit a need that a really good team had. Like, Edmund was already very good without Echo, but he got there, and his impact on Bouchard his slotting for even and see at times the run they went on last year, he's carried it over to this year. The offense that he's been providing lately is not what he's normally known for, but yeah. still like, you, like it's a pretty good shots on both the goals last night, like legitimate sniping kind of shots. But he also, you know, he, he is intensely prideful of how he plays defense. And I think that is sort of a mindset that the others, you know, really should embrace. Like how much he cares about being good defensively. Talk about how hard he plays every single po- every single play. It's it's pivotal. And also on some level, and you know, guys get traded all over the league. And I think part of the reality for Canada in general is that a lot of players they get traded to Canada. You know, they're not entirely. They don't embrace the idea of being in Canada. And I think Ekholm, for all the stuff he does well on the ice. He also really seems to enjoy being in Edmonton and being an oiler and living in Alberta and playing in the cold weather. Like, he likes that. And I think that's also part of a guy sort of being the best version of himself and being the best for the team. Yeah, he's, he's been incredible. I saw, you know, plus minus, which is one of the most flawed stats there is. I think since the trade, he's the highest in the yep. league plus player. Um, I think it's no surprise Bouchard has really taken off with Ekholm's influence and now Ekholm and Coffee's influence. Like, he's been supremely important to their success. So, yeah, um, you can talk all you want about Jack Campbell, you know, maybe a, a signing that didn't work out. You can't forget about Zach Hyman, a, sign, a signing that did work out, and, and Ekholm, a trade that, is, that has actually been brilliant for the Oilers, really since he got there. Mike, and I was, I was talking with Dusty earlier, too, and, and we look at the Ekholm acquisition last deadline – Fast forward to this deadline, and, and people are talking about, you know, Walker, Carrier, and everything. Then the Oilers go out and get a Troy Stetcher, which is not really, you know, greeted here with the fanfare and parade that that maybe some of those other names would be. 
But I think last year at the trade deadline, too, Echo maybe wasn't at first. Like, it was, it was one of those names that kind of came out of nowhere. So, I'd like to get your thoughts on Troy Stetcher. Small sample size thus far. But I think, you know, assisting on the blue line a little less than Ekholm. Ekholm's that top guy. Stetcher, you're looking for a little help, a little a little um, something building from the bottom up on the blue line. But your thoughts on him? Got a point last night, just over 15 minutes of ice time. Once again, I know it's only been a few games, but what's the ceiling for him and how can he kind of build this blue line up from the bottom up? Well, he's a depth guy, right? Like, he's not going to be a frontline player. He might not even play every game in the playoffs, depending on injury and match and everything else. But the one thing about Troy is that he's a smaller player, but he plays bigger than – like, his intensity, the competitive spirit that he has, is sort of beyond his size. And I think that's what he brings. He brings like a real passion, lots of confidence in who he is and how he plays – um maybe better with the puck than you anticipate but you know you need to manage him you need to play him in a third pairing role watch who he plays against watch where he starts on the ice but you know in the smaller sample on a good team he moves the puck well enough that he will will help you a little bit so um you know not gonna blow you away but if the Oilers play for two more months after the season they probably will need seven eight yeah. nine defensemen and having stetcher as what your six seven eight is the proof spot to in because he's been in a lot of places he's had some success he's played more minutes bigger roles and he battles he's not scared of the moment and he battles mike johnson with us on the show this morning audio is still good video is buffering here hopefully that'll kick back in but uh <laughs> let's keep rolling because we still got the audio it's just, still, I look still look great you, you still look yeah, great you look no, like you look, look like unbelievable. your identity cannot be revealed <laughs> If we need you to talk in like, <laughs> oh, I'm Mike Johnson. This is my thoughts. Uh, did you did you ever think Zach Hyman would be a 50 goal scorer in the National Hockey League, Mike, when he was leaving Toronto and coming to Edmonton? For two seasons, of course. Yeah, you know, he'd, he'd be a solid 25 goal guy. Yeah. No, I mean, listen. I think everyone appreciates what Zach Hyman is, the path that he's taken, the way he stayed true to himself on and off the ice. The way that he understands that he may play with the best players in the world, but he doesn't have to play like them to be successful. Um, but no, I don't think anyone, even if you put him with McDavid or Drysaddle or Matthews or whoever, you know, scoring 50 is scoring 50. And it's not easy to do, no matter how many times Connor McDavid or the power play sets you up or whatever. Um, he's gotten really good at not just getting to the net, which, you know, that's a lot of will and sort of strength and, and guile, but then making good plays when he gets there, like having a very good stick in and around the net. No, I mean, I thought if he could get consistently around 30, yeah, that would be really exceptional production. Like a 30-30 guy playing with top players and doing all the things we love, that would be, that's what you thought Zach Hyman's best version of himself might be. But obviously he's blowing right through that. I love the fact that scoring 50 is such a prestigious number. And he's not even creating any drama. Like he's gonna do it with ten games left. Yeah. Like he's I like know. he's at this point. He's thinking, well, what's fifty five? What's fifty seven? Could he get sixty? I mean, like that's crazy. But that's where it's at. I mean, I know last year a few guys scored sixty, and McDavid and Pasternak and and Matthews has done it. But you know, in the last since since the the oh four lockout, right? Stamkos did it once, and and Obi did it once yeah. prior to last season. So. The fact that he's going to be pushing mid fifties at least is incredible and stunning. I think even to Zach Hyman, he's still the same guy. He's kind of whole hum about the whole thing, but he must go to bed at night going, "What is going <laughs> on here?" Like he just cannot stop scoring. It's been cool to watch. You're happy for him if you know him because he's a, he's a good person. But I don't think even the most optimistic projection of Hyman would have been this kind of goal scoring. So the Oilers and Leafs on Saturday night, Hockey Night in Canada. The entire nation's going to be watching as the big boys kind of go head-to-head -head here. Uh, where are the Leafs at right now? Where's their game at? The Oilers only have one regulation loss in like their last dozen. They've had some ups and downs within these games, but they found a way to come out on top the majority of the time. What are you expecting from this head-to-head -head battle? It's funny. I mean, I cover the Leafs an awful lot. and like They're like 13-4-2 in the last seven, like they've gone on a really good run as well, but they don't feel like they're that good. They don't feel like they're an upper echelon team. They're a good team. They, they're in that tier 
in the East, there's four, I think, really good teams. The Leafs are not one of them. The Leafs are the fifth team. But the Leafs are better than six, seven, eight. They're sort of stuck in the middle. Yeah. Um, their good players, as we know, have been pretty good. Their defense is a work in progress. It's amazing. Like, there are three weeks left in the season. If you're not Sean Keith, honestly, your starting six defensemen look like if everyone's healthy. He wouldn't know. Yeah. He doesn't know who to play with. Who. He doesn't know what matchups like what how compliments what if you were to ask them even if mitch marner was healthy which he is not he's got the high ankle sprain. who's gonna play with who up front he wouldn't know there's still so much in flux lots of moving parts on the lines up front um you know they they can score goals obviously austin has, has been had an incredible season some of the depth scoring is sort of coming around now max domi's i just incidentally enough you'll love this that assists Per minute played, Max Domi second in the league behind Connor. <laughs> pretty good. Wow. Like, who, like, I mean, it's a pretty subjective stat, but you know, he's been bertuzzi has been better as of late. Tavares has been better as of late, but they just feel like they are not right on top of it. They're good enough and play well enough to win the majority of the games, but they don't yet feel totally dialed in. Like when I watch the Oilers play their best games. They're 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 very tight in what they're trying to do. The Leafs still feel like they're figuring things out, which is crazy to say with a dozen games left. MJ, as always, buddy, we appreciate the time, man, and uh, we'll catch up how's, next how's, Friday. How's oh, the bracket? Yeah, going? how's your bracket, Mystic you, Mike? You, you perfect bracket still, or what? Yeah, you know, I had Kentucky for sure going out. Uh. Um, yeah, they kind of <laughs> like yeah. The the best part is I used to love this day when I was in high school. Don't do this, kids. Stay in school. Yes. But I would not go to school on Thursday and Friday, opening weekend of the March. Like my, which is my parents just sort of eventually just conceded the fact that I liked it too much. I would not go to school those first two days. I'm almost more. I want to watch the women's tournament more. I, I, I honestly, I'm like watching for when's Iowa on more so than when yeah, yeah. men are on. Like I don't. I am more into the tournament because of the storylines in it. So no, not a perfect bracket. I fill one out anyways. It's destroyed and it's embarrassing. That's why I'm only mystical when it comes. <laughs> <laughs> All right, man. We'll talk to you next week.